Well, Rodney was a premiership player with the Hawks, also represented Brisbane for a time. Most recently coached the Gold Coast Suns, but before that was a drought-breaking grand final coach of Sydney in 1996 and led the Western Bulldogs into three consecutive preliminary finals in 8, 9 and 10. But most recently as well, coach of the Baldwin Football Club in Melbourne's East, which included an emerging player by the name of Cooper Sharman, who burst onto the scene over the last month of the season, kicking 10 goals, including four against Fremantle in the last game, in which he was one of the unluckiest players in history not to receive a Rising Star nomination on the back of that effort. But Rodney, thanks very much for uh, for giving us some time. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, guys. Good to be here. Now, starting off with, with Cooper, I guess your first impressions back in the day, you would have had him as a teenager and... Um, did you know at that point that he was going to do what he did? And, and, and what was his development like as a young player? Yeah, he, um, well, he just lobbed on, the, lobbed on our doorstep. Probably we'd already done a bit of pre-season before Christmas and then starting the January, probably lobbed towards the end of January. He's obviously from Leeton and he came down to uni at Deakin Uni. And one of our more experienced players was from Leeton and played in a premiership with his dad at Leeton. So um, Cooper came down and... And Liam Fraser said, "Oh, listen, come play with us." So he just lobbed really quiet lad. Uh, didn't know, didn't know anything about him. Um, and then you could just tell on the training track. All, and all of us said, "Oh, this kid's got something." Um, obviously, you know, there's another level we're at, a fair bit low below AFL level. Um, and then we played him. F- practice matches started in the seconds. Um, dominated. Um, played a couple of senior practice matches and started in round one against a very good side and. Uh, against a player um, who ended up being probably the best player in the competition who played the premiership at Box Hill and was the most contested marks in the VFL that particular year with, um, and now he's gone to play in the waffle and Cooper outmarked him a couple of times and we're going, oh, this kid's got a, he's got something. And uh, so he his progression was slow. He's, his raw talent was exceptional, but he's a very quiet lad, um, very compliant, Probably too compliant, you know, so, you know, very respectful, do the right thing. Um, so didn't do a lot. He, you know, he's got a, had a lot of areas to work on, especially in the athletic department. Like he naturally athletic, but never been able to, uh, I would say, got fit. Uh, the running patterns, our grounds are smaller. So he'd get eight or nine possessions, um, but he'd take it, do something special every now and then. One game he, he, he highlighted and kicked about four. Um, but you could tell he no, he had something. So I um, I found a couple of clubs actually. I found a couple of AFL clubs. I won't say who they were, and people I knew. And then I spoke to a, so that was the the main recruiting guy that those particular clubs. And I spoke to a mate of mine, who was just a recruiting guy. And um, we had a few phone calls and um, Oakley Chargers. We'd spoken to them, and so they asked him to go along and he played. He played the the last third of the year at Oakley, but this compliance, I think. Uh, and I'm surprised, sorry, surprising that clubs didn't take him as a rookie. I, I could believe because it's supposed to be a futures market and I could just see there's so much upside in him because he's never had the development. He's never had training in an elite system ever. Um, and But I think going into Oakley Chargers, they had Raul and Anderson, uh, but more so Jamara. And I feel he was pushed, at, pushed to the side and he was so compliant that he, most kids have got a fair bit of confidence. He's got enough confidence, but would just take the game. Well, he didn't. He just got out of the way for Jamara. But every now and then, apparently, he did some really special things. And I, I've got a feeling the AFL clubs looked at more about what he couldn't do rather than what he could do. And I always have the analogy. If he was an Irish kid, clubs would have been doing handstands and backflips over it. Like, he, he could kick. Apart from kicking goals, his field kick, most guys who are good goal kickers aren't the best field kickers. Plug is an exception. Plug was an exception, exceptional field kick, but Cooper's a really good field kick. Got high footy IQ, reads the game really well. Like that pass last week to Jack Higgins was, uh, was a little bit loopy, but he's, he's a vision to see that. Um, and uh, I, I couldn't believe that clubs wouldn't have taken the punt on him as a rookie because there's so much upside. So um, then in 20, he was going to play at Coburg. Uh, he didn't get drafted. Then the season got wiped out. Then he went to Adelaide. Um, I think Woodville West Torrens, one of the guys, that, that one of the coaches, I think, was from Leeton, uh, from that way. So he went there, but got injured early, started in the second. So he hadn't done a lot. And I think your recruiting manager's from Adelaide, isn't he? Gallagher is from Adelaide. So he must have had intel over there and, and a lot. And, and I think full credit to St Kilda, they took him. And I think 
he, what you're seeing now is only the only the tip of the iceberg. I think he become a really good player. Rocket, you, you talk about his upside, but what what does his ceiling actually look like? Does he remind you of anyone in particular that you either played with or against or coached uh, against or, or coached? Um, it's a good question. He, he reminds me not as a bigger jump, even though he's got that in, a bit of a Jeremy Howe type player, that lean. Now, now we know where Howe's gone to as, as a defender. I don't think Cooper's a defender. I think Cooper's got good, uh, has got good forward craft. But there was one mark he took at Bournemouth. He he had his feet on a bloke's head. Like, <laughs> you, you, you know, he can do that. Like contested marks he took last week were just really well timed, and he jumped in. He's got a good jump. Up. He's got a bigger jump than that. And I, I think once he gets his uh, a few pre seasons into a couple of pre seasons into him and be able to taught the running patterns and the second efforts and things like that that I. Uh, uh, are judged uh, greatly at AFL level. Now, I've, I've, got, I've got a feeling maybe the recruiters judged him on that, and I don't think you should. You should judge him on what he could do and then be able to develop that. And so he reminds me of that. He'll be that third tall forward for a while. Um, I know he played full forward a bit at the weekend, but with a view that maybe he can become a key position once he becomes a bit stronger. Now, I was going to actually ask, do you think that... I've heard a few people say they were a little concerned about having oh. him and King and Mambury and possibly any, another tall forward if we pick someone else up, all trying to squeeze into that forward line. He he moved up a, onto the wing a few times as well as a bit of a, I guess, a, a chop out of taking the mark and getting it up, up the ground a bit further. Do you think he could play that sort of taller winger as well, if required oh. at times? Yeah, I do. I um, when at ball, and I played him a couple of times on the wing because he didn't run a lot, and you can tell he, he had a big tank. He wasn't super fit, and even though we had small, we were playing on small grounds, but he just had the habits of playing like he did as a seventeen-year-old back at home. Um, I'm just trying to get him to run a bit more, and it was quite surprising. He has got a bit of speed, and I think once he learns, he's so compliant, he'll he'll learn that because he's got some drive in him, and I think. Just being in that an elite program, and they get some K's into his legs, and he could play that uh, hybrid um, forward role. And they can get up around a bit like Jack Gunston did, and when he in his prime, so can mark with the best of them. But and that's probably his best role, I think, because he's lean. Get the memory and King's obviously taller, um, and they can probably play another guy who's bigger. Whether the ruckman rests there, I think Cooper's quite good on the ground as well. So. Just don't be judged by his height. I think he's got the ability to, once he learns some running patterns, etc. he can play that wing role, that high forward, and I think he'll be exceptional at it because he reads the game really well. How difficult is it from a player's point of view? I mean, you coached, for example, a Bulldogs team that had Barry Hall and a Bulldogs team that didn't have Barry Hall and was a little bit smaller, for example. Mm. Looking at someone like Cooper when Max King was there playing that sort of second or third role versus on the weekend when he wasn't there and he had to play out of the goal square, does it tell you much about a player that, you know, they can adjust from I'm second fiddle to the giant or now he's not there so I've got to be the main man and the fact that they can adjust to that type of role? Yeah, I, I think, and that comes back to his compliancy. I think mm -hmm. his compliance, he, he probably with Max King, oh, I don't want to get in his way so he'll play more, you know, he's kicked a couple of goals each of those first three games, mm -hmm. which is a great effort. But he's he's had his seven to ten possessions, which is a, a Cooper game. He did that at Baldwin. He did that at Oakley. Now he's doing it at AFL level. So, no, he can do it on his ear. He can go up a gear. So, now um, with King out the weekend, he's he's, he's blossomed that because he, I, I believe his mentality is, oh, well, I have to do it. So, I'm the person um, that's in the, in the main role where what he's got to learn is that he can impact and be able to do things, even if King's there and Member's there and he's the third wheel, he he can be a quite a dominant player still. If he if he uh, and I think that'll just come with time and confidence. Once he gets uh, used to the system, used to the coach, used to the players around him, confident with his teammates, confident in his environment, because he's such a respectful lad, and I think he just um, getting that time and. Now, that's why I can see the, uh, now the sky's the limit with him, really, that he can really improve in a great way. Rocket, going back to your uh, your playing days, you grew up in, in Tassie, which is famously a, a bit of a breeding ground for, for St Kilda. Yes. What was it like growing up down there? And, and did you have kind of St Kilda heroes? Did, did the club ever try and recruit you as part of that kind of Tassie influx? 
Now, there was a big Tassie thing. I know growing up, I was a Collingwood supporter, unfortunately, um, you know, because uh, I came from a working class suburb, Glenorchy, which was black and white. And we'll, so, uh, we'll cut that bit out. Yeah, we'll <laughs> cut that bit out. Um, but it was very much a St Kilda uh, stronghold as support. You know, obviously Bulldog, uh, Verdon Howe before that, um, or at the same time played there, Ian Stewart. I mean, great players. John Bonney then when he came over. There was quite a few great Tassies who went to Melbourne but didn't stay for long. Um, John Bingley played in the Premiership in 66, who's a Tassie legend. So it's a really big uh, Tassie supporter base. Um, so so when I was growing up in, you know, in 71, I remember watching that as a 13-year-old live. Uh, I was battling for St Kilda. I wanted them to win uh, against the Hawks. I didn't, didn't follow the Hawks. But, um, yeah, so there was uh, a big uh, a big feeling of St Kilda. No, they didn't ever ask me. I played... One year of senior footy at Glenorchy um, under Peter Hudson. Um, so Peter, obviously, it spoke spoke to Hawthorne come watch me. And then um, they were the only club that spoke to me. So uh, I was happy to take that opportunity. And going from playing to coaching, um, you left the Dogs in 2011 and Ross Lyon also left the Kilda in 2011. Was there any approach there at any point? To what you might be up to the year, next year, or uh, you no, didn't, didn't, hear, didn't, didn't, didn't no, hear from the Saints at all? No, no, didn't uh, didn't have any um, any uh, any dialogue with them. So, um, uh, so who, who took over from us? Was it was it Scotty Waters? Scotty Waters, Waters, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I didn't uh, didn't have any dialogue at all. So, has uh, has oh, there ever been any any conversation during multiple times of of coaching change at the club? With St Kilda, you mean? With St Kilda, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I never had any dialogue at, at, at all over much period of time. It's probably been half a dozen, eight clubs, but the Saints haven't been one of them. So, Where do you assess, before we let you go, sort of where they're at at the moment? We're discussing a little bit off there that it's been a frustrating year, but if you were looking at it from a, a list management or a coaching point of view, would you look at it and say, I can see clear upside that... You know, they can return to finals footy. There's only a few things they have to tweak uh, and what perhaps might they be? Yeah, I, I think, um, I think probably, I don't know if unfortunate is the right phrase and I think frustration is probably a good word to use. You knew they had the talent to be able to make the eight. Um, you know, so tight. Uh, and they, I haven't followed them closely, but is it fair to say they missed a few games by not kicking accurately as well? They, yeah. Um, they, and people, I remember going to Collingwood when um, first went there as coaching director, and I walked into this meeting, and they were doing their review. And Nathan, Buck, Nathan Buckley put me on the spot, and he's and they're big on stats. He said, "What's the most important stat in football? What do you think the most important stat?" And I said, "Kicking straight for goal." I said, "That's the first thing because if you," and they just looked at me incredulously. Oh no, it's got to be. And uh, you take the ball from the back fifty to the forward fifty, and the percentage of this and the percentage of that. And I said, "Well, get get inside fifty enough." If you can kick straight, you can have 15 5, you can win games. Um, if you kick 10 10, you're not going to win. So um, so I think that's an area if we, and I think that's that's true with most teams. They do that, they would have won a few more games. I think uh, their defence, they introduced some new non, no names players, and most of their no name players have done well. I think uh, they got those uh, five recruits the year before and propelled them up last year for various reasons a couple of them dropped off but they can come back um i think uh their midfield they need some support for steel in there i think yeah. probably a good midfielder crouch has been okay but he's then steel was not quickly they probably just need a speed around the ball um mm. and uh defensively defensively they've done well with the no names but if they could get a obviously the rucks marshall can stay fit it's a bonus for them for you and um just that another key defender, that stronger type who can play there, where the battle can jump up to be that, um, and, and they can keep developing. I think they've gone to trade. I, I, if I was trading, I'd only try and get diamonds in the sand. I wouldn't try and get big names. I'd go to the draft, um, develop, and put and put some extra resources into the development. Rocket, last one from me, but it's, it's always obviously been a big uh, topic of conversation over the last few months. But where do you stand on a on a Tasmanian? AFL team and should it be a, a, a Melbourne club that, that moves south or, or what, what's your what's your standpoint? No, I think it's got to be a standalone team. I think Tassie's such a footy state that all the people there have got their own AFL team. So so it was North Melbourne or Hawthorne or whoever 
relocated there, you'd only get a certain portion would support them because it's not a Tasmanian team. And if they called the Tasmanian Hawks or whatever they were, it wouldn't be the same. So there has to be a standalone team. Um, and I applaud the Premier for standing up like he did and not calling their bluff, but being strong. And they've obviously got from to the negotiating table with the presidents, which will be another big hurdle to overcome because they're, with all due respect and, uh, to them, they're going to worry about their club, and so they should, uh, about the cost factors and does it does it drain any more money out of the game that they won't they won't have. Um, but I, I think it's the best way to go to get the standalone team. That's a 19th licence. We'll get a 19th licence. Um, I think it'll be self-funding. I, I believe they've got a good financial model that they'll be able to stand alone. The North-South divide, I think they'll all jump on board as long as we get a good ground in Hobart. The Bell Reeve Oval is not a not a great ground, to be honest. Um, as far as access, we can't. There's only one road in and out. Um, it's windy. Um, they can build that stadium they're talking about at Macquarie Point. It'd be fantastic. So to answer your question, yeah, I think I think I think they could not only survive but thrive down there, and I think it'd be great for footy. And as finally, obviously, we've got one horse in this race probably but uh, you got a Brownlow tip and then a premiership tip um which probably Bontempelli v Oliver um for me um uh he's had a great great uh, year Oliver um he's true Bont's dropped off a bit the last few weeks but you never know I mean can the umpires get the decisions right how they're going to vote so it's always a worry for me um so it's a big enough job for them to do I was probably put to their tongue in cheek facetiously but, <laughs> but it's a it's a, a it's a it's a tough job they've got then to be able to to vote on that uh so but I reckon those two are the folk the premiers I think the competition's really even and I don't say this nicely I think the competition's dropped a bit so therefore, some teams have improved at the top ones. So it's concertina, and I think we'll probably get that more and more. Uh, for me, I think Melbourne. I think Melbourne can win it. I, I, this Giants and Sydney Weber wins that may cause some trouble, but I don't think they can win it. It's too too hard to an ask. I don't know whether Brisbane can. I don't know if Port can. Um, but playing at home suits them. But I think the Demons. Now they've got everyone available. Um, they're, they've got a really good midfield. Um, so, um, yeah, they're my team at the moment. Rocket, but I'll, the pre but I'll <laughs> change it. I'll be changed if they get beaten. <laughs> <laughs> Rocket, appreciate your time. Roy's very generous. And uh, thanks very much uh, for that. And also, well done with the, the development of Cooper at, the, uh, at his infancy. It's uh, bearing fruit. Yeah, yeah. We'll keep following him, boys. I know you will. He's a really good lad. And um, he will take... Uh, Certainly, mark of the round at some stage, and hopefully, mark of the year. So uh, he'll, he'll be he'll be a, a joy for the Saints supporters. We look forward to it. Thanks, mate. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you, mate. Thank you.